Okay, good afternoon. Um, so I have some some announcements before we get started. I'm uh, still getting emails from some of you about not being able to access the, the Zoom video recording. I know every time we complete the lecture, you get an email from Zoom saying that, okay, you can access the video using this link. I don't control that. That's a uh, automatic message that is sent by by zoom to all the members of the of the class uh i do have access to that link uh and i think i get a password is a different password for every link that they send uh what i found out is those videos they are not stored forever there they just last seven days so if i share with you the link from zoom and you try to use that after a week, you will not be able to access the video because it's automatically deleted after seven days. So uh, that's why I use YouTube. What I typically do is after the class, I download the video so I get a copy of the file and then I upload that file into YouTube so you can have access to the video for the entire semester. So um, I'm surprised that some of you still not don't know where to get the video link. Uh, if you go to modules for every day, you'll find a link for the lecture. So if you if you want to see the video, you can go to the module for the day, and there should be a link for the video for that day. Uh, again, that will take you directly to the YouTube site where all the other videos are are saved. Um, so there's a playlist with all the recordings for this semester. Um, you also find lectures from previous semesters, but for this semester, there's a playlist. You can find all the videos for this semester. Um, what else? So again, if you don't know, still don't know where to find the videos, you can go to the modules. There's a section for the, the day. There's a video recording link. You can use that link and you will get the video for the day. Um, the other thing is um, questions such as, where is the second exam or all those things are, are listed in the syllabus. So the syllabus is also available in, in the Canvas site. So you can download the syllabus, it's on the main page. There's a link there with the yellow highlight. You can download the, the, the syllabus from there and the dates for the exams are there. Uh, the assignments and the labs, they're again posted. Deadlines are posted on Canvas. Uh, I typically let you know in class if you have a lab, where it's due. But if you're if you're not sure, you can always check the Canvas uh, site and you will get the, the date for submission and you can upload your solution from there. So again, I, I, I don't have a problem with answering these questions. The, the thing is, it kind of concerns me because we are halfway through the semester and there are some, there's still these questions coming up. So um, so at this point, I think most of you should, should be aware of where to find things. Um, so that's it. Uh, any, any questions? I know there was assignment due today. Uh, so 
you you can upload the solution and there's a lab today so you have you have until midnight to submit the solution uh, so let's let's get started um, we started discussing some of the space requirements for facilities design um, I'll say the the last lecture we started with that topic um, and then we cover the Design for um, cooling requirements, heating requirements, and also the lining systems. Today we're going to continue that discussion. We're going to look at other other systems within the facility. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about some of them, and then we're going to go in deep in, in some of the most important ones. So the next one is the life safety systems. And for for this one. You just need to be aware of um, of the importance of designing a facility and, and taking into consideration these these safety um, requirements and systems. So these are designed to control emergency situations that will disrupt normal operations. Some of the examples are listed here. Um, emergencies created by fire, seismic events, or a power failure. So all those things can happen at any time. There's some, some areas that are more likely to, to be uh, impacted by a seismic event. For instance, uh, I read this week that uh, for the West Coast, it is expected that something happened in the next years in terms of a seismic uh, catastrophe. So uh, there's a high likelihood of that happening in the Bay Area and some, some, some of those things are being discussed by the scientific community now. Uh, so keeping in mind those uh, potential events is, is important as a designer. So we need to make sure that our facility uh, provide for these emergency situations. Uh, fires, power failure fire is another one that is happening quite often lately. And in this area, Central Texas, um, Gulf Coast and so, so on, the Gulf of Mexico, we know that we're exposed to hurricanes. So um, events such as um, flooding and, and those things are, are also relevant. So fire is the most uh, per pervasive of the three and accounts for the majority of costs associated with disasters. Um, so yeah, fires are those that can happen anytime. We don't necessarily have a, a total control about the things that can cause a fire. It could be equipment, could be a, a malfunctioning of, of a system, it could be a, a person in the in the staff creating the fire. So uh, those are the ones that are typically most common. And fire resistance is therefore critical in the design of a facility. So um, not only by providing uh, the sprinklers and, and so on, but also making sure that we have access for um, the um, fire ban and, and so on. So in terms of fire protection, the first objective of the facilities planning planner is to determine the building's function and construction type as defined by the occupancy classification. So here we have this table uh, these, uh, there are different groups and depending on the type of facility, you, you select the, the group that is more appropriate for the type of facility that you're designing. So in our case, if you're looking at factories, manufacturers and processing, that will be group B, group F, I'm sorry. Um, so these are building occupancy classifications that are based on the International Building Code or IBC. Uh, the type of structure also governs the degree of fire resistance um, and the fire resistance therefore refers to the ability of a structure to act as a barrier that would not allow the fire to spread from its point of origin. Uh, so this classification will basically tell you this is the amount of, of protection that you should have based on, on the type of facility that you are trying to, to design. Um, so there's no such a thing as a fire immune building, you know, there's no way that you can completely make sure that a fire is not going to happen or occur. So the facilities planner must be con convinced of the need to provide safety routes as an integral part of the layout. 
So, so at least you should have two or uh, two exits in which you, you allow people to, to leave the facility. So at least two or more exits. Uh, more local building codes require that a maximum allowable time or distance to exit the building not be violated. So for example, uh, a rule that can be used is that no point can be more than 200 feet from an exit, 250 feet in a building with sprinklers and up to 400 in a building with early suppression, fast response, fire protection, and automatic smoke and heat vents. So again, depending on the type of protection, you can see at, at there's three levels uh, here in, for this example, no sprinklers, 200 feet from an exit, that's the maximum distance. If you are with a building with sprinklers, then 250 feet. And if you have more protection, 400 feet uh, for those um, cases. So here's more, more information. Um, in terms of the maximum floor area allowance per uh, occupant. So depending on the type of building, you know, uh, floor area per, per occupant in feet square. Uh, so again, making sure that we don't uh, build an area that uh, is gonna have more people that it can hold to. Uh, the minimum number of exits for occupant load. So if you have 500 or less, the minimum is two between 500 and 1,003 and over 1,000, the minimum is four. And in the remoteness uh, requirements, uh, two exits, four exit access doorways, uh, where two exit, four exit, do exit doorways are required from any portion of the exit access. The exit doors or exit access doorways shall be placed a distance apart equal not to less than one half of the length of the maximum overall diagonal dimension of the building or area to be served, measuring a straight line between the exit doors or exit access doors. Basically what this is saying is you don't wanna place those doors in the same wall or in um, across to each other. You wanna place them at, at the distance that you, you are gonna provide the, the better uh, access and, and departure from the facility. And that's in general, in terms of uh, life safety systems. On our next lecture, we're gonna look at personal requirements. So here we're gonna focus more on the needs of the staff and how the facilities design more accommodate, must accommodate those needs. So personal requirements. Same uh, objective, we are trying to understand the principles of facility location, layout, and material handling systems, and to practice designing facilities. And in here, we're going to look at this uh, topic, uh, specifically the employee. So how is the employee influencing also the facilities design? So for example, the office space, um, if you need to design for a parking facility, how to design that? So you can accommodate as many uh, vehicles as needed. Uh, restrooms, office planning, and finally the barrier-free compliance. So we are gonna do some designing, uh, specifically for the parking. We're gonna spend some time. I'm gonna show you how to design a parking facility for uh, a, a specific number of cars uh, based on the space. And, how is that connected to the facilities uh, planning again? If you're gonna have a building that is gonna hold these many employees, you have to provide for a space for them to, to get to work, unless you're close to a, a mass transportation system. If that's not the case, then you have to make sure that you provide enough space for them to park. Uh, restroom, same thing. How do you design for a specific number of people and office spaces? Uh, that's part of the facilities, right? So you, you need to provide the space for uh, manufacturing, uh, warehousing, but also space for uh, people to work on, on, on the business side of the, of the company. 
Uh, so the planning of personal requirements is include planning for employee parking, uh, locker rooms, restrooms, food services, drinking fountains, and health services. So all those things are there. They're not adding anything to the product that you're manufacturing. They're just there to keep our uh, personal and staff um, in a good environment, uh, working environment. So you need to provide for space for parking, lockers, restrooms, a place for them to eat or to purchase food, um, a place to drink water. And also in, in so many cases, you need, if something happens like an accident, that you have some uh, healthcare or uh, health service available. Uh, the facilities planner must integrate barrier-free design in addressing the personal requirements of the facility. Okay, so we, we are not only designing for, um, well, we have to take into account every person when designing the facility. So what is the employee facility interface? Again, the, the staff, you as an employer, an employee, you go to the facility, you're gonna be interacting with different systems. Maybe you will not notice, but those are systems that are in place. So you can have a, you can go, go to work and you can uh, perform as expected. So an interface between an employee's work and non-work activities more must be provided. Uh, there's companies that are taking this to the next level, especially uh, IT companies that are providing for more things to people so they can feel home at home when they go to work and they don't wanna leave the facility. Um, but there's, that's not always the case. Uh, so, but we, we still have to provide those uh, aspects, those, those areas in which the employee is gonna interact with the facility. Um, so the interface functions as a storage area for personal property of the employee during work hours. So I'm showing here in the, in the picture, uh, you have to provide that type of storage. So uh, the staff can bring their, their belongings and they don't have to carry them throughout the, the facility, right? You put them there and once you're ready to leave, you can pick them up. Uh, personal property typically includes uh, cars, and employees' personal belongings, such as coats, clothes, purses, and lunches. All of those things, if you think about going to work, especially during the winter season, you have to bring a jacket. If it's raining, you need to bring an umbrella. Um, lunch, if you bring your lunch, you need the space to put those uh, somewhere, right? So, so you have to provide for those areas for your personnel. Uh, employee parking, again, important one. Uh, so how do you design for a facility? You need to have some space for parking. So um, you wanna plan ahead, like, you know, the building is gonna be this side. You are gonna expect this many people, so this many cars. Uh, so when you're planning for the area that you have available, you have to balance that trade-off. Are you gonna have a, a, a facility that is this size and we're just, just gonna left some space, small space for parking. So that might not be feasible because then you will have more people that you can accommodate. So you have to find that balance. Uh, so what is the procedure to plan for a parking lot? Here we have some guidelines. Uh, first, determine the number of cars to be parked by type of car. So. Um, so what I refer by type, you maybe have some compact cars or you have like in Texas, most of the cars are, are not compact. So you have to plan for that. Uh, what is the, what is the uh, approximate uh, percentage of uh, compact cars that you expect? Also, if you have to provide for disability spaces, um, that's another important component. So, then determine the space required for each car. Then determine the available space for parking. Uh, determine the alternative parking layouts for alternative parking patterns. So we will see the difference between the patterns in a minute. Uh, so if you think about, if you go shopping or if you go to campus, there's different type of layouts that you will encounter. Um, so for example, there's some parking lots in which you can only drive in one direction. There's some parking lots in which you can drive in both directions. Uh, some of them have uh, the parking spaces with a angle. Some, some of them just have 90 degree spaces. 
So all those things are important when you're considering the space that you have available and you're planning for a specific number of parking spaces. Uh, select the layout that best utilizes the space and maximizes the employee convenience. So there will be some parking spaces in which you just have parking, right? And there will be parking spaces in which you have an area for people to walk. Uh, all those things occupy space. So it depends on what you want to provide, the space that you have available, uh, but you want to maximize the employee convenience. Uh, the number of parking spaces to be provided must be specifically determined for each facility and must be in accordance with the local zoning regulations. Uh, adult minimum requirements can be as low as two handicapped spaces per 100 parking spaces. Five handicapped spaces per 100 parking spaces, it's not uncommon. So if you are planning for uh, having 200, then you should plan for have at least 10. Uh, handicapped spaces and so on. Uh, the size of park of a parking space for a car, which is expressed as a stall width times the stall depth, can vary from 5.5 times 12 feet to 9.5 by 19 feet. So again, depending on the size of the car that you're designing for. Uh, small compact cars will be 5.5 times 12. Larger cars, 9.5 times 19. So the total area required for a park car depends on the size of the parking space, the parking angle, and the aisle width. So here's some recommended range of stall widths in feet for various car types and uses. Uh, so here we have the width. For a small car use, you have uh, between seven and eight. All day park use between eight and I will say 8.5. And then as you go um, growing in size, luxury, elderly use, standard car use, the, the space of, of the aisle uh, grows. Uh, so, so this is the recommended range of stall width in, in feet for various cars, types, and, and uses. Uh, so what are the factors to be considered in determining the specification? Uh, first, the percentage of cars to be parked that are compact cars. 33% of all parking is often allocated for compact cars. So about one third of all spaces. Uh, increasing the area provided for parkings decreases the amount of time required to park and depart. Um, Angular configurations allow quicker turnover. Perpendicular parking often yields greater space utilization, although it is also required uh, wider aisles. So if you provide an angle, then you're saving some space. Maybe it's more difficult. Or as you, if you use an angle, most likely you only have a one direction um, for driving. So yeah, so you have the advantages and disadvantages. And the question is, what would be the right trade-off? for your company. Um, when you have some of the companies, when I worked for Johnson & Johnson, is it, it was a uh, operation, it was dealing with a, a lot of chemicals and, and so on. So for safety reasons, they wanted to have their parking facility uh, at the 90 degree angle. And also they wanted everybody to park backwards. So in case there's an emergency, everybody can leave the facility quickly. So there are some things that you have to take into account also when, when building these uh, parking spaces. Um, as the angle of the parking space increases, so does the required space. So here's some um, information about the, the angle, the, the type of design, uh, and, and also the width of the, of the aisles. So we have, one, two, three, four configurations, W1 up to W4. And they're all different. So this is W2, W3, and W4. So in the first one, we have what is called a single loaded wall to wall. So you only have a, a lane. So you have the aisle and you only have one lane of parking spaces. 
and you have both in both sides, you have wall. So these things are representing walls. Um, so the theta value is the parking angle. So theta is the parking angle. PW is the parking width. And SW is the stall width. So at an angle of 90 degrees, uh, PW equals SW. Um, so PW is, is illustrated here. So this is the, what we are measuring, the parking width. Right? If it is at an angle, you're measuring from this point to this point. Uh, and then at 90 degrees, that's gonna be equal to the stall width, which is the measurement here to here, right? So this uh, size, um, and this is the angle right here, right? So this is the angle we're measuring. So let me show that. So stall width is here. Uh, parking width is here, and here's data. So on a second configuration, this is a double loaded wall to wall. So here we have a single loaded. Again, there's only one lane of, of cars. Here we have two. And then this one has a concrete uh, curb. So this is what we are referring to. So we have some space here for people to um, maybe walk, so this space can be used for, for those purposes. So if you wanna um, put some plants and so on, decorations, you can do that. Um, double loaded wall to wall. Uh, so here we have this side with the wall and then here you see that you are saving some space, right? So you don't have the, the concrete or curb here anymore. So you have only parking spaces. So that's what this is called wall to CL. Um, and then here is the, the, uh, the, the same configuration, but here we have C, CL to CL. Um, so no, no um, concrete curve um, and so on. So these are the possible configurations, W1, W2, W3, W4, you see how this, the, the width it's changing, so this one is requires less space because there's only one one loaded uh, area. Uh, here we have two with greater than this. You have double walls, I think double loaded wall. And as you if you change configuration, you will have a different requirement in terms of the space that you will need. So as as I mentioned already, you have to know how many cars are going to be compact, and then how much space you're going to have much the area you have available to, to design the parking lot. And then you have to choose one of these configurations for the type of parking so you can maximize the, the benefit of the employee. So here's some um, itemized uh, values for some of the things that we, we discussed. Uh, so start with, this is for small cars, eight feet, and then with, uh, depending on the, on the angle that you wanna use. And then the tabulated values are for these different designs, W1, W2, W3, W4. So depending on, on the style that you wanna use, then you're gonna have the measurements uh, for the, the space that it's going to occupy. So for example, if you're designing for small cars um, and you wanna use W4, and you can see how, as you increase the size of the angle, the space required to build such a um, design is increasing. So if you wanna make it 90 degrees, you know that you need this much space for that design. If you wanna make it 45 degrees, then this is the space that is going to occupy that design. And you can accommodate different designs within your, your parking space. 
uh, but we want to keep it consistent, right? So small cars, and then you have the standard cars. These are, uh, we have three levels for standard cars, eight and a half, nine feet, and nine feet and a half. So depending on the size of the cars that you want to design for, you again, look at the, the requirements and then pick up the, the right measurement. Uh, and then we get into the large cars. So from nine feet to 9.5 to 10 feet. Professor. Yes. Is there a um, general standardization that folks you that uh, not necessarily companies, but I guess just in general use. The reason I'm asking is because the different places I've been, like if you go to Europe, typically until about 20 years ago, the vehicles were small, but now the vehicles have gotten bigger and the parking sizes are the same size. Obviously they didn't reconfigure like an entire parking garage. So what, how do you make that decision if there's a non, if nothing standardized for a typical size parking spot to where you can actually accommodate what's being used on a regular basis, what's truly to be expected. Does that make sense? Yeah, so so again, yeah, those are the challenges when you're designing a facility um, that you know the decisions that you're gonna be making are, are final, right? And to make changes to, to those decisions is gonna, I mean, you're gonna need a lot of resources in terms of money and, and staff and, and it's going to require some time. So, um, so yes, that's that's a good question. So, uh, as we discussed in one of the previous lectures, we we have to be aware of the the uncertainty. We we, we have to plan for for uh, not only right now but also for the future. And it's uh, basically looking at the tendencies about what can happen, and then try to incorporate the potential scenarios in our design. But yeah, that's that's a good question. So after you make those decisions and you see that the outcomes are different, yeah, the only option you have is to try to revise those decisions, and that will require some extra resources and and time. Um, but yeah, and 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 yeah, facilities design, and 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 I think that's one of the the, the points that I made earlier. Uh, these are decisions that are going to be lasting for for a long time. And that's why we need to be aware of uh, potential changes in products, potential changes in the demand, um, and also what are the potential uh, what's potential uncertainty that we we have to be aware of in terms of the market and, and tendency. So, uh, but yes, that's that's a common common question, not common question, but a common uh, scenario that you will face as a facilities planner uh, that you make a decision, and then ten years from now the the situation is different and you have to make uh, try to make uh, changes to your your current situation um, we have, we have seen that now with the uh, transition from gas engines to electrical vehicles um, things that were the normal the traditional designs in terms of manufacturing those are changing and some of the facilities that uh, were, uh, prepare for manufacturing cars are no longer, um, they are not uh, providing the needs for the design or for the manufacturing of, of electric car. Uh, so companies that are moving from gas engine to electrical vehicles, they're facing those challenges. So how to revise uh, their current facilities? Uh, do they, impl do they um, put the money into uh, redesigning these facilities or it's less expensive to just build some some new facilities el elsewhere. Uh, so those yeah good good decisions um, are are based on, on on what is the current situation of the company and what you think is going to be more beneficial for for the future. So sorry I went too long but yeah that's that's my my point on that. Any other questions? Good, so um, the employee parking. So we're gonna use the information from these uh, tables and figures to try to design a parking facility. And the goal is to optimize the space, allocate it for parking and maximize the employee convenience. 
So let's try to do uh, one example here. Walk with me here, and then you're gonna have a, a lab in which you're gonna try to, to replicate this uh, design for a different uh, example. So we have a new facility that has 200 employees. And surveys of similar facilities indicate that one parking space must be provided for every two employees. And that 40% of all cars driven to work are compact cars. So you had that estimate. Again, going back to the question, this is something that can change, right? So this is the uncertainty. So do you design for 40% or do you increase or decrease that based on what you will expect in the future? Uh, so 40% right now, 40% of all cars are driven to work are compact cars. 5% um, of the spaces should be allocated for the handicap. And the available parking lot space is 180 feet wide and 200 feet deep. Assuming no walls and no walking edge, edge Determine the best parking layout using uh, a stall width of 8.5 feet for standard cars. So we have information about the size of the facility. We also have information about the percentage of cars that are compact, uh, percentage, obviously, uh, the complement of that percentage is gonna be standard cars. Um, and we have information about the stall width, 8.5, and we are designing for standard cars. So out of the 100 spaces, 40 should be compact cars. However, not all drivers of compact cars will park in a compact space. So that's the other thing. Um, like you see it here in the, in the um, university, there's some spaces in some of the parking uh, garage that are designed for compact cars, uh, but then you will see compact cars parking on the other spaces. So we cannot control that. So that's um, not all drivers of compact cars will park in the comfort space. Therefore, we're gonna design for less uh, spaces for compact cars. Uh, only 30 compact car spaces will be provided. So instead of 40%, we'll go down in that direction because we know that some of the drivers of compact cars can also park on the other spaces. So that will not be a limitation. Um, but again, knowing that you have compact spaces that will allow you to generate more parking spaces at the end. So that's the trade-off. If you design for compact spaces, then that will open more space for parking spaces. Um, so we'll begin the layout out of, of the lot using uh, 90 degrees double loaded two-way traffic because of its efficient use of space and to determine if the available lot is adequate. So we're gonna start with this uh, design typically takes the most space, but it's in phase uh, is efficient in terms of letting you um, drive in both directions, right? So you can have uh, people going in both directions. So double loaded two way traffic because of its efficient use of space to determine if the available uh, lot is adequate. So we're going to try to see if this module uh, W4 which is uh, one of the largest ones. Uh, if, we, if we use that module with the space that we have available, if we get at least the amount of space, the amount of spaces that we need in terms of parking. If the answer is no, then we'll have to go to a low, uh, another module that might occupy less space to see if we can at least get to the number of spaces that we need. Um, so from figure two, W4 is, uh, the required module and using W4 module and table 4.1, we can obtain the following. So, um, so we're designing uh, for standard cars. All right, let me mark that. For standard cars at 90 degrees using W4. So for compact cars, we have a fit um, using module four. So let me use the highlighter here. Um, 
So let's look at the small cars first. Um, and then at 90 degrees, that will be this number, 57 feet and two inches. And for standard cars at nine, 8.5 or eight inches, I mean, eight feet and six inches for W4 and six, uh, 90 degrees, we have a 66. Okay, so based on the requirements, we are gonna use these two dimensions. For compact cars, 57 and two inches, or uh, eight feet and six inches, or standard cars, we're gonna use 66. So we're gonna write that down on the, on this slide here. So I have comfort cars. We have eight feet, zero inches. The module width is 57 feet with two inches. And for standard cars, oops, and this is for 90 degrees W4. And for standard cars, eight feet with six inches, 90 degrees and W4, we have 66 feet with zero inches. So that's the module width that we're gonna use. Any questions about this? So we got the size of the cars that we need. You know that we're gonna be designing for compact cars and standard cars, and we are gonna move forward from here. Uh, so we're gonna check to see if the depth of the lot, 200 feet, can accommodate a parking layout consisting of two modules of standard cars and one module of compact. Okay, so then the reason we are doing that is to see, okay, how many modules we can fit. And then based on the size, we know how many spaces we're gonna have available. So if I had two modules of standard cars, those are 66 feet. and one module of compact cars, which are 57 feet with two inches. Sorry, this is feet and this is inches. Then the total size will be 189 feet with two inches. And we know that we have 200 feet, right? So 189 feet with two inches, is less than 200 feet. So therefore, the depth requirement is okay. Okay, so we can feed this module of compact cars and two modules of standard cars into this lot that has a depth of 200 feet. So we are okay. We have some room for, uh, some additional room here, bless you. Uh, so, so each compact car module row will yield a car capacity based on the width of the lot. So this is 180 feet divided by the width requirement per stall which is eight feet times the rows per module, in this case two. So we're gonna have a, so basically what we are saying now, we have, use this color, so we have a space. Obviously this is not up to scale. So this is 180 and this is 200. 
right? So 180 and 200. And what we are saying here is that we can split this area into three with this, uh, an area for compact and two areas for regular. So the question now is, I know I have these three spaces allocated for regular cars and for compact cars. Um, so how many cars I can fit in this compact uh, area? I mean, the cars are gonna be parked in this way. So based on this dimension and knowing the stall of each car, I can estimate how many compact cars I can fit in this module. So that's what we're gonna do. Uh, so this is 180. That's the width, right? This width. And I know the, um, the width requirement per stall is eight. And I'm gonna have two lanes. So this is two times two. And this is gonna be equal to 44 potential compact cars. Okay, so two lanes, right? One here and one here. That's why we're multiplying by two. Two lanes into the module, and we know is uh, stall with stall requirement is eight, so 100 by divided by eight, we get the number of potential cars that we can fit in one lane, and then we multiply by two, so it's 44. Um, potential compact cars. Uh, we were shooting for how many? 30, right? So we have 44, so we should be good. Um, this number is gonna decrease because we have to design for the circulation lanes. Okay, so that will remove some of these uh, parking spaces. We'll get to that. So similarly, each standard module will a uh, row will yield a car capacity based on the width of the lot. 180 divided by the width requirement per stall is for the standard cars is 8.5 times the number of rows per module, which is two times the number of modules, which is two as well. So we are multiplying times four. So for this one, we have a 180 divided by 8.5, which is the width of standard cars, multiplied by two lanes, multiplied by two modules. And this is equal to 84 potential standard cars. So a total possible 44 plus 84, 128, which is greater than the required number, which was 100. Therefore, module configuration W4 is feasible. A possible alternative of two rows modules times two standard modules plus two rows of modules by one compact module for a total of six rows is the starting point of the layout. Okay, so at this point, we know how many cars we can fit but we still have to design for the uh, circulation lanes. Also, we have to modify to account for the handicap requirements. Okay, so we're gonna use, because we know we have more than enough of compact cars based on the requirement. We only needed 30, we have 44. So maybe we can modify one of those lanes to accommodate the handicaps. And that's what we're gonna do. Uh, so row one will, so when I say row one, let me draw this again. So I have these three areas. This is compact, regular, regular. This is 180. And this is 200. So I'm gonna have two lanes per, per module, 90 degrees, right? So 
So this one, I'm gonna call this one lane one, lane one. This one is lane two. This one right here is lane three. This one is lane four. This one is lane five. And this one is lane six. So I have six lanes. I'm gonna use the first lane to accommodate the handicap. So row one will handle Let me just call it row one, row two, row three, row four, row five, and row six. So row one will handle all five handicap spaces, which is the requirement. So we need five and the width is 12 feet. So this is 60 feet. And the remaining space be occupied. will be occupied by standard cars. Okay, so I think I labeled this incorrectly. Let me go back based on my current design. We're gonna use the space from regular parking to accommodate the handicap spaces because we have more um, standard car spaces than what we have for, so this is row one, row two, row three, four, row five, row six. So we're gonna put the handicap spaces here um, in this lane. So the remaining space will be occupied by standard cars. So that means that we are gonna have 180 minus 60, which is five times 12, the space that you need for the handicap, divided by the space with for uh, standard cars. And that is a total of 14 space. So what that means is we're gonna have here in this first row, we're gonna have five handicapped spaces here. And then the rest is gonna be 14 for regular cars. So that first row will have 14 spaces that are for regular cars and five spaces for handicap. Okay, so we, we are not gonna touch that one. That one's done, but we have to account for the circulation lanes now for the parking facility. And that's gonna impact row two, row three, row four, and row five. We need to uh, design for the circulation lanes and those are going to be impacted. So for the circulation lane, you change the corner. We are gonna have a circulation lane here and a circulation lane here. So those rows that are marked are gonna, those spaces that are under the circulation lane are going to be eliminated because you need that space for circulation. 
and not row six is not going to be impacted, only rows two, three, four, and five. So, yes. You mean this this space right here? Well, you have at the top and at the bottom. You have to. Oh, you already have. Yes, yeah. yeah. So we're gonna have to design for the top and also for the bottom. Oh, that's the yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Sorry. So basically, we are cutting all this and all this. Yes. Um. So. Row adjusting for two circulation lanes. Of fifteen feet each. So we're gonna cut that space out of these uh, rows. We're gonna have the following 180 minus 15 times two, all that divided by 8.5. And this is going to be 17 spaces. So for the regular lanes, this one will hold 17 spaces. This one will hold 17 spaces. And this one will hold 17. For row one, we're going to have 14. So for the first one, we have 14 because we have the handicap plus the regular spaces. And then for two, three, and four, we have 17 because we need to adjust for the um, circulation lane. And then uh, we have to do the same thing for the compact. So for row five, we'll have One eighty minus thirty. Again, the circulation lane spaces divided by eight, and that's going to be equal to eighteen spaces. So this one will have eighteen, and then finally row six, which is not impacted by the circulation lane, will handle. 180 divided by eight, and that's 22. So we get the totals, we get our design, 14 spaces, 17, 17, 17, 18, 22. You see the size of the cars is having an impact on the number of cars that you can accommodate in each lane. Um, we are accounting for the handicap here. Uh, so we have 14 because this one occupies more space. In this one, we have the circulation lanes impacting the, the design. And then in this one, there's nothing. So that one will be a regular um, amount of space. So if we go to the last slide, you'll see this is the nice configuration. This is what I try to replicate here. This is my uh, kindergarten drawing, and this is the nice one. So you see, um, we get the same circulation lanes. Uh, we have the, the handicap spaces here. We have row two, row three, row four, row five, and row six, 22. And the total number of spaces is here. We have 40 compact, 65 standard, and five handicap. So a total of 110 spaces uh, and we were shooting for a hundred. Yes. 
that's a good question. Um, you can see that's happening in here, but we didn't specify that from the beginning. Um, and that's something that you, you have to take into account. Again, we are assuming that the entrance will, will happen in either in this area or this area. Your design is gonna change according to where you place the, the entrance. Right. Yes, so under that assumption that will be here yeah all, all those things are possible again those are decisions that we can accommodate based on the under the the knowledge of where the facility is going to be placed yeah in this case we didn't have that assumption stated from the beginning. So we are just designing for the number of spaces. But yeah, those are good questions. So if you if you are going to place these handicapped spaces, they have to be close to the facility. If you want to incentivize the use of these compact spaces. Uh, but that's, that's something that we can debate, right? Because uh, even if you put them close, that doesn't guarantee that people are gonna follow the the recommendation, right? So you you see people with regular space cars trying to park close as close as possible. Um, so I think that's that's the major um, incentive when you you what most people will use in terms of making the decision is how close it is to to the what, the place that I'm trying to to reach, right? But yeah, that those are good points. Really good points. Any any other question? Yes. What is the model? Is like each row or each wing is like one specific type, but in actuality, like like you were talking about, like some of them are supposed to be the content. How would you incorporate that? Uh, so they have different width requirements. So you're you're so you reserve like the first I don't know thirty spaces like directly in front of where the building is for compact. How would you Okay, so so the question is, if you were to, instead of forcing this to be a specific module with the total space being occupied by regular cars. Um, so yeah, I mean, we we, we started the, the exercise on the, the assumption that the whole space was available for the design, right? And we were trying to split it into these big modules, right? But we can easily split this into uh, two areas, right? From the beginning, we say we we are gonna design for compact cars from this lane, uh, this line up, and then from this line down, we are gonna design for standard cars, and then you will follow the same process. It's gonna take you some more time because you're essentially designing two two parking lots uh, in the same area, right? If you split this area uh, in half then the top half was gonna be only compact cars. The bottom half will be regular cars and you can proceed in that fashion. Good question. Or if you start under the assumption, instead of splitting the facility in this direction, you split it in this direction, then you, you can use the first, assuming that the facilities or the store, or whatever you're designing for is at the top. If you split this in three rows in this direction, then you can design the first module for, for contact cars. That's the other option. Any other question? Good. Uh, so really we have time. So let's, let's try this maybe. This is uh, an example of a problem should be easier because we are only designing for standard size cars. Um, so we have a parking lot 400 feet wide and 370 feet deep. And we wanna say how many standard cars are fit in this lot, just standard cars. You don't have to uh, design for handicap or uh, comfort cars. Just wanted you to to follow the, the steps. Um, 
you're going to use the W2 module and a 90 degree, um, 90 degree angle. And what else do you need? Um, W2 and for standard cars. So let me put that here. Standard cars. Meaning eight feet six inches and ninety degrees. So here you have two options. The, the dimensions are different for the Y than the D. So if you're designing one direction, you will see depending on the on the configuration, you decide to split this facility. Uh, you might get more spaces than um than using the different configuration so basically what i'm saying is if you have this 370 here and you split this this way uh you will get a, a specific number of cars numbers and then if you split it this way you might get more so that's that's what i'm trying to say either way it's going to be right okay so you you choose the configuration that you want to follow And what you're gonna do is just submit um, online. I, I guess you need the tables, right? To get the, the dimensions. Um, so let me go back here. So you are, you need this dimension right here. So standard cars using W2 is uh, 66. So that will be this number. Or 90 degrees. And the module with 66, that's the value you need. Other than that, you got the all the information you need. Yes. So if you do three seventy divided by sixty six, it'll be five point six modules. So this will be five and a half, meaning that you can have one module with just one lane and five modules with two lanes. If you use 370 as your dimension, if you use 400, then you might be able to fit the, the entire six modules.
Uh, for this exercise, there's no need to just design for standard forms, no handicaps. Um, I think you forgot. Wouldn't eleven? Oh no, never mind. You did it differently. So based on this configuration, I have eleven rows in five point five modules. So two rows per module, and then I have a uh, half a module with one link. The circulation lanes are 15 feet each, right? So you have to cut some of these rows um, 50 feet times two, 30 feet, and then compute the, the amount of spaces that you will have for rows two to rows 10.
Okay, so here we have the next steps. You determine the number of cores per lane. So you have 400, uh, the dimension, the depth, divided by 8.5, that gives you 47 cars per row. And then adjusting for two circulation lanes, you have about 43 cars for those lanes that are impacted by the circulation lanes. So now you just have to find out the total based on that. So, and um, rows two, three, four, five, up to 10, will have 43 cars. Rows one and row 11 will have 47 cars. <clears throat> and you find the total. That makes sense. If you're done, then you we are done here. So submit by midnight and enjoy your spring break. You could. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's the standard size, 15 feet. Yes. Yes. Correct. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Uh, circulation lanes, those, I mean, in this case, they will be per per perpendicular to the, the, the road. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Yes. Yeah, enjoy the, the spring break. Be careful. Come back safe. We'll be here. The question about the homework issue today. Yes. So like the, the um, decimal, are those figures? So like for each individual thing you're calculating, is it always going to be that decimal? Gonna you the, the number of units that no, you're no, using? Like, um, the factor. The U factor. Oh, the U factors. Those, yeah, uh, that's a good question. So I, I didn't provide the U factors for these problems in the homework. Yes, I made the assumptions that we are, you were going to use the ones that we discussed in class. That's what I wanted you to do, uh, but I didn't specify that. Those are changing according to the location and the type of material that we use in the facility. And in the previous lecture, I provided a link. I need to update your slides, but you can get those U factors from uh, standard code. Yeah. Uh, we'll be will be provided. I mean, I'll be providing those numbers for problems in class. But if you need those in practice, you you'll find those in in these um, codes for engineering. Yeah, engineering codes. Yeah. Okay. So I'll stop the the lecture recording. And I'll see you guys.